use this method of the rotating, the rotating disk electrode. And we've already mentioned it. Typically, let's just schematically indicate what one actually looks like. If we bought one from a vendor, it would look something like this, a fairly big cylinder which would have a brass shaft. And since it has to rotate, we need some sort of rotating electrical coupling. And that usually is with a spring and a carbon brush. Um, if you've ever used a, a drill or something, you'll often look in the drill and you see those little sparks. That's just that brushes in there running the motor. So it's a carbon contact. And that just rubs against that brass piece as it's rotating and continues to stay in contact with that. As you might imagine, that also adds some electrical noise to the system. So sometimes the rotating disk electrodes are a little bit noisy for that reason. Luckily though, the currents are often high enough to avoid serious difficulty in that particular reason, for that particular reason. That then would have, a, extending into this material, often made of Teflon because of its uh, chemical inertness, also because Teflon can be, we can press fit things into Teflon and make a nice electrodes out of them. At the end of that, we would have a pellet of our working electrode material. As I said, it could be platinum, gold, carbon, silver is often used, um, and various other materials, palladium, for example. Uh, as the brass comes down, usually there's a little pocket here, and that's a little pocket is filled with uh, carbon powder. And the idea here is that rather than trying to directly attach the brass to the metal, which can lead to some corrosion problems also, it's not very mechanically stable. If it flexes a little bit, you can break the connection. So just compress some carbon powder against the top of your electrode and the brass together to make a, a somewhat flexible electrical connection. And so at the bottom, you'd have just a, a little disk of material. And as its name states, it will have a rotating disk electrode. Again, we, then we would stick this in a, uh, a motor with a motor drive and just rotate that at whatever rotation rate that we'd like. Now, the reason you can buy these, and they turn out to be kind of expensive, three, four hundred dollars or more, and the reason you buy them is that it can be a little tricky because it has to be fairly well balanced. If you try to use these at high rotation rates, you get some vibration, you can get some problems with uh, of the thing not being balanced, and so you have to have a pretty well engineered system to do it at high rotation rates. So it can be a little bit tricky to make um, for yourself. Unlike normal working electrodes, which don't have to be moved, uh, these are uh, have to have specific shapes to work well. How we're going to solve this is you use a cylindrical polar coordinate system. So in our axes, what we're going to have is our disk will sit in a plane which is a, a Y and R radius and uh, also a cylindrical coordinate down where Y extends uh, to infinity at uh, the end. So right in the center of our disk, R is equal to zero. So the, the line that goes down this way is the zero uh, point for the R coordinate. R extends radial out, and that will be our coordinate R. As we extend down into solution, that's going to be our Y coordinate. So Y is equal to zero at the electrode surface. Y is equal to infinity as we extend out. Now at the surface of the disk, when we rotate this, what's going to happen? We're going to start having solution being sucked up really into the disk for reasons we'll explain in a minute. As it's sucked up into the disk, we're going to get a flow relative, to in, we're going to get a flow in the y direction, 
And what's gonna happen is that at the surface of the disk, the relative velocity of particles relative to the surface of the disk is gonna be equal to zero. And the reason for that is that as the solution particles hit the disk, they're dragged along by frictional and viscous forces. And so the velocity with respect to the solution may be non-zero, but with respect to the disk is zero. So the solution is being dragged along the disk surface. As it's being dragged along, it's also gonna be accelerated radially outward, and so the solution will be flung out on the edges of the disk. So what you have is motion into the disk and then a, a flinging outwards of the solution. So essentially you have material coming in and exiting in this particular direction. And so that's what you get, sort of a suction pump effect on the thing. So if we draw a little diagram along the y-axis here, If we put our disk right here in the center, the velocity of material in the y direction is gonna be small immediately next to the electrode. It's gonna be zero right at the electrode, but near the electrode it's gonna be less than, it's gonna be a little bit more than zero. And then it's gonna reach a maximum value some distance away and then drop again. So we have this distribution of velocities at some particular point. And there is a, a, a boundary layer, a velocity horizontal that we've got, and we can, or we'll call them, um, and uh, we can call the distance where that velocity is, is is uh, considered to be that the hydrodynamic boundary layer is called 3.6 omega or nu over omega to the one half. So y sub h is the hydrodynamic boundary layer. At distances closer than y sub h, the velocity becomes small. Solutions greater than y sub h, the, the, the velocity becomes small again. Uh, these units in here are ones we have to worry about. Uh, omega is often used for angular velocity. And uh, often you'd call that, well, units would be per second or reciprocal seconds, and that's units of radians <laughs> per second. It's related to frequencies of other sorts, and hertz, for example, by the relationship two pi f, so so many uh, revolutions per second is related to radians per second by this uh, relationships of two pi f. New is a, a new term for you guys probably, and that's the kinematic viscosity. And it's related to the static velocity viscosity, eta, by the solution density. And the kinematic viscosity is the normal viscosity divided by the density, and so it has units of centimeters squared per second. And kinematic viscosity of water solutions is about um, 0 0.01, approximately 0 0.01 centimeters squared per second at room temperature water. And it's not too different for other normal solvents. And kinematic viscosity accounts for the fact that the solution is moving when we're doing the experiment, basically. Right. So again, we're not gonna solve the solution for a rotating disc electrode. The book outlines how you might go about doing that. We'll just give you the, the result. The idea, though, is you'd have a, a fairly well-defined 
system of, of uh, coordinates and you can solve that by assuming certain velocity uh, distributions. But let's give the basic results. Now for an oxidation, or for reduction process, you can take your oxidized molecule and reduce it. The curve that you see is a steady state curve and it has a limiting current. And these are exactly like the curves you saw when we first showed current potential curves. Now unlike a cyclic voltammetry, we don't see the peaks in the wave. The same experiment is being done though. You're sweeping the potential, recording the current, but now because of the uh, mass transfer process not only being diffusional but also uh, convective, we have a different sort of shape. So the limiting current in that particular case for oxidized molecule being initially present in the system would be 0 0.620 NFA and they've, they've collected some of the constants in the system. NFA, NF area of the electrode diffusion coefficient of oxidized molecule, rotation speed to the one half power, angular velocity to the one half power, kinematic viscosity to the minus one sixth power times the concentration. This particular equation is called the Levitch equation. Named after Levitch who um, derived it originally. And remember in the first chapter we talked about limiting currents and we said that we can have a limiting current for a steady state curve like this as being equal to NFA, M0, concentration of O in the bulk. And we can approximate that by using the Nernst approximation where we said there was a Nernst diffusion layer thickness where in that thickness of, of, of solution, the diffusion takes place outside that thickness, the concentration stays constant. And so in the Nernst diffusion layer um, approximation, our mass transfer coefficient was D0 over delta zero. Now for RDE, That's the approximation Levitch made when he solved this problem. He said that the mass transfer coefficient was indeed D0 over delta zero. And so in the terms of this equation, it turns out that this relationship also then is equal to 0 0.620 times the diffusion coefficient to the two-thirds power, rotation rate to the one-half power, and the kinematic viscosity to the minus one-sixth power. They basically said in solving this is that, okay, we have the concentration of species O as a fraction of the bulk, bulk here. This would be X going this way. For a distance delta away from the electrode surface, the system is under diffusion control. And if we think about it as sort of in a Cottrellian type way we maybe have a concentration of zero at the electrode surface. So our concentration goes to the bulk over this distance delta. In actual fact, this is not exactly how it would be, of course. We wouldn't expect to have a nice abrupt uh, squared off change there, angular change there. We have sort of a nice gradual change. So the actual concentration gradient would be something like that, but our approximation is reasonably good where, where it counts, and that's at the electrode surface. It's not so great away from the electrode surface, but that's not so important. So what's the, the assumption here? The assumption is that there's a diffusion layer thickness of delta. Outside delta, the concentration is equal to the bulk concentration. It's equal to the bulk concentration because we've stirred the solution up. And so outside that, there's always going to be this uh, constant refreshed solution coming into where the electrode is at. So the concentration stays close to the bulk. Near the electrode surface, because the concentration, because the solution is now being dragged by the electrode itself, 
and there is no velocity towards the electrode, only velocity along the electrode surface, there is what they call a stagnant layer near the rotating disc electrode. And that stagnant layer, in that stagnant layer, we don't have a net velocity towards the electrode surface. And so that's our, the effectively what's our diffusion layer is. That stagnant layer is where the, where we have this boundary layer, it's also called a boundary layer. We have a boundary layer of stagnant solution where diffusion takes care of the rest of the mass transport. So we have convection up to delta and then diffusion into the electrode surface. In reality, of course, it's a mixture of both, but for the purpose of the model, which is a pretty good model, actually, we've broken it up into two sections, a diffusion part here in the, in the boundary layer, or stagnant layer, and a convective part out here. So let's take a look at that. Well, if we look at this equation, you see that as the rotation rate increases, we'd expect the limiting current to increase. As you might expect, the faster we spin that electrode, the more the current is going to increase. And so this is a nice way to adjust the mass transport rate. All you have to do to change the mass transport rate is to change the rotation rate. And if we could change it infin infinitely fast, then we would have no problem. We could study any electro electrochemical problem. But unfortunately, we can't uh, change it to be infinitely rapid. We can go pretty fast. Now, that's for the one, for ox only present in that system. And that again is for the limiting current. In other words, we're on the top of the wave. So we don't have any uh, electron transfer kinetics to worry about in that case. For the reversible case, where both ox and red are present, Again, reversible, no kinetic effect. The limiting anodic current is equal to minus 0 0.620. It might be as you'd expect, NFA D0, um, D sub R, two thirds, <laughs> omega to the one half, kinematic viscosity to minus one sixth, concentration of R on the bulk. Uh, Notice that's wrong in the notes. It says D sub O in the notes. It's D sub R in actuality. And we can use all the same things we used before. If you remember, we derived this case before in the first chapter, second chapter, and we said the E is equal to E one half plus RT over NF, natural log of the limiting cathodic current minus the current and the current minus the limiting anodic current. That gives us the wave shape. And uh, just like before, if we plot current versus potential, we would see, for the reversible case, a, uh, the sigmoidal shape with a zero crossing point, which would be the E equilibrium, and our limiting currents for the two branches. And the E1 half is, as we previously indicated, be the E0 plus a correction for the differences in the diffusion coefficient of the two. All right. Now, this is a reversible case. What happens now if we have a, a rate constant limitation? We can uh, and sort of think about it. And we know that in order to have a, a reaction to occur in the first place, we have to have a, some finite rate of electron transfer. It can't be zero. So we have to have something above zero. And if it's not infinity, because no reaction rate proceeds infinitely fast. So there's going to be some interplay between what's the fastest rate of mass transport, the rate at which we get surface stuff of the electrode, and what's the rate at which the reaction actually occurs at the electrode surface. And as we would expect, if the rate of reaction becomes limiting, if it's slow enough so that it doesn't matter what the rate of material to the electrode is, the rate limitation is the rate of, the, of electro, or electrolysis, or the rate of electron transfer. So in that case, if we plot the current, well, let's just make this quick plot up here. 
if we plotted current versus uh, the square root of the rotation rate, we would expect a straight line. So we can show that, there we go. So we get the current versus the square root of the rotation rate as this equation predicts, and we get a straight line. Same in these two cases as well, limiting an cathodic and anodic. If we have a kinetic limitation though, what we get is initially probably a straight line and we'd expect it to follow the theoretical case for a while. But at some point, uh, depending on the rate, actual rate of electron transfer, we'd see a deviation. And eventually it would become, a minimum, uh, it would plateau off. And we could indicate that plateau for the current, the limiting current, as a kinetic current. That's the most current we can get given a particular rate of electron transfer. It doesn't matter if we increase the rotation rate anymore because there's only, we can only do the reaction so rapidly. Now of course, as we change, the, if the kinetic would change, then that I sub k would change. Uh, and we can examine this curve by changing the rotation rate and map it out and then use that to give us some information about what the rate actually is. So in this case, then we can break the curve that we see into two components. And we can write that the total current, one over I, is equal to the kinetic current, let's call that I, this would be ILC, plus one over ILC. Now, of course, knowing what exactly what that I sub k is depends on, is, is uh, part of the trick, but notice how easy, much easier it is to get I sub k or the kinetic value for the rotating disk electrode than say this, the cyclic voltammetry for diffusional cases. Since we know that the current, kinetic current is equal to some function of the potential, it has to be, for example, the simplest case would be the irreversible case. Again, where O plus E only goes to R with some forward rate constant, not allowing for a back rate constant. We'd have a, a, a function case of F that depends on E times the bulk concentration. And KF as a function of E would be probably the Butler-Volmer relationship for metallic electrodes but not necessarily, depending on the kind of surface you've got. Really all well, we're interested in is the mass transport here, not necessarily on the, uh, on the electrochemical part of it. We can imagine, for example, we suppose we didn't have a metallic electrode, we could put a, a layer of enzymatic molecules on that rotating disc, uh, some insulating rotating disc, because the enzymes have a kinetic mechanism to turn over some species, we could investigate the mechanism of enzyme uh, turnover reactions by doing the same process. In that case, the kinetic current would be the enzyme kinetics, and in that case, the case of F would not depend on E, it would depend on substrate concentrations and so on. So the idea is the same. We would get a limitation, a, current, a kinetic limitation at some point and not necessarily a Butler-Volmer kinetic limitation. So if we plot one over I for two situations, and say we change the rate of electron transfer, initially quite low, uh, or quite low uh, rates of um, mass, I should say, rotation rates. What happens now if we have increased the rate of mass transport while the kinetics are somewhat slow? You might recall some of these effects. If the rate of reaction becomes slow or compared to the rate of mass transport,
happens to this curve is it starts to lean over. Okay, so we get a curve that looks something like this. And notice that if we're sitting here at um, E1, or at E2, oops, yeah, we get two kind of different results, quite different results. E2, we're always at the limiting value, so we could say E is equal to E2 for this particular case, whereas E would be equal to E1 in this particular case, because now at E1, we do definitely see a kinetic effect. Notice that only when we're at the lowest rotation rate will we see a curve that's near the limiting current. Even then, we're a little bit into the kinetic limitation. But these other ones are significantly limited but for the kinetics. Compare that to the case if we had completely reversible kinetics the whole time, the waves would, would always have essentially the same point at which we could say we run a limiting current. So by measuring this diff distance or this intercept, that gives us the number one over I sub k. It's a very simple way, elegant way really, to get kinetic information. Current in this case would be equal to NFA, K sub F C zero star, one plus K sub F delta zero over D zero. And uh, again, it doesn't matter what we assume KF is, if we can assume it's a potential limited or some other way of getting KF. Notice of KF times delta zero over D zero. Now again, delta zero or D zero is in the rotating disc electrode case equal to this. <coughs> if we had some other sort of uh, system that gave steady state limiting currents, it would be some other result. So that's our approximation. Now if this value is much, much less than one, in other words, Kf over m sub zero is much, much less than one, we're going to be always in this kinetic control, or sometimes called activation control. We're limited by the rate of reaction, always, not by the rate of mass transport. So if we can just manipulate our experiment to be in this particular zone, we can always get kinetic information out of the experiment. If on the other hand, Kf delta zero of D zero, much, much greater than one, in other words, Kf over the mass transfer coefficient is greater than one, we're in mass transfer control. And we have no hope of getting kinetic information out of our experiment. And this holds for all the cases of steady state situations. Anytime we can write down a mass transfer coefficient, this holds for every particular case. Uh, so for example, this holds for the rotating disk electrode, it holds for uh, a, a rotating wire electrode, it holds for experiments with ultramicroelectrodes, it holds for experiments with the scanning electrochemical microscope that we use in our labs, and so on. All these steady state limiting current type experiments can be analyzed in that same ideal way. Again, once we go back to rotating disk electrodes, the way we change the mass transfer rate is to change the rotation speed. So we can adjust the mass transfer rate. So we can adjust it perhaps to go from complete mass transfer control to complete kinetic control simply by turning a knob, changing the motor rate, uh, rotation rate. Now, we are limited ultimately um, by the value of omega. First of all, once omega gets significantly less than about 10 per second, we start to see not, uh, re not good hydrodynamic uh, uh, things. We start to see a, a predominance of diffusional-based electrochemistry. We're just not stirring the solution enough to get into the kind of uh, system we'd like. So this is a diffusion um, problem. And once we're greater than 
a thousand rotations per second, we start to have things that have to do with turbulence. We go from a, a laminar type flows to turbulent flows, which are not uh, tractable with these theoretical methods to analyze. Also, we get things like splashing of the solution. It's very difficult to go much faster than a thousand reciprocal uh, seconds. And so you do see you have about a hundredfold, a factor of about a hundred to, uh, to vary things around, which it really isn't very much if you think about where you're in. So you, it's not a great, you know, you can't really just complete the whole gamut of values of mass transfer coefficient, but you can often adjust things with, to, so to lie within that range. <coughs> 